I'd like to introduce our last speaker, uh, Professor Jerry Heyman. Jerry is a professor of electrical and computer engineering, and he's one of Wyoming's own. He grew up in Sheridan County, did his bachelor's and master's work at the University of Wyoming before going on to the University of Wisconsin, the other UW, uh, for his PhD. Dr. Heyman is an expert in a high-level area of mathematics called Fourier analysis and works on its applications in real-time signal processing. What that means to the rest of us is that he works on ways for machines to sense the real world through the mechanical equivalence of, say, sight and sound, uh, and then record it, react to it, and even control it. You can often tell a lot about a scientist's career from their research grants. When Professor Heyman arrived at UW in 1993, his first small grant foreshadowed the directions his career would take. It was called Research and Instructional Focus in Real-Time Control Applications of Digital Signal Processors. We find here research and digital signal processors, but note that it also includes instructional focus. On the one hand, Jerry has pursued hardcore research in studies like, quote, methods of assessing adverse effect of increased efficient utilization of electrical energy, and I'm not even sure I can pronounce all the words in this one, uh, fault tolerant high precision point vibration isolation and vibration absorption using flexured parallel kinetic machines. Finally, my favorite, space-based long distance laser pointing and tracking. I think Star Wars every time I read it. On the other hand, Professor Heyman has pursued issues in how to teach undergraduates, in particular, how to teach them math, science, and engineering throughout most of his career. He's worked on projects uh, to help students in, quote, thinking and doing mathematics and science, and also on how they can pursue, quote, active learning in science and math. His most recent work focuses in this area, focuses on the important issues, uh, and let me just read to you the title here, uh, Pathways to Work, Self-Efficiency and Retention of Women in Undergraduate Engineering, addressing a very important uh, issue uh, with regard to current teaching and engineering. Today, uh, Professor Heyman's going to talk to us about a project he conducted a few years ago, uh, primarily around here in the Jackson area, on the important uh, subject of avalanche monitoring. Professor Heyman. Thank you, Paul, and um, thank you again to our hosts. It's been a wonderful experience to, uh, for me, come back to Jackson. Um, and to take a little bit of time away from Laramie and get back to what I refer to as, uh, for me, the mecca of avalanches. Um, <laughs> th this has been a valuable place in the research that we're going to talk about today. Um, I really do want this to be a conversation, so I'm going to try to get you active almost immediately. I did see a shirt over here of the other UW, so go Badgers, that's good, and so on. Um, how many people here are educators? have some extension into education and so forth. I owe my life and my profession that I'm in now to you guys. Thank you very, very much for everything you've done. Um, I was one of 24 students who graduated from Tongue River High School. Has anyone heard of that place? Excellent, yeah, it's somewhere <laughs> north of Sheridan, almost into Montana. Um, a lot of what I learned on top of a Shetland pony and at, at the end of a shovel, hopefully the correct end of the shovel, um, has gotten me to where I've gotten now. Um, a lot of the work ethic that our students have is something that I value very much and it's why I came back to Wyoming. Um, I love this place and um, there's a very fruitful um, amount of research and education that we will do many, many centuries from now, I think, just here in this wonderful place called Wyoming. Um, how many people recognize the name Rod Newcomb? Anyone out there? Yes. Um, as you'll see, I need to uh, pay the appropriate tribute to the appropriate people as we begin to talk about this topic. So I've got a, a captive audience who wants to see Avalanche. Here we go. Have you ever heard an Avalanche? Yeah. 
Have you been close enough to hear it? Becomes the next question. Um, was that a frightening experience for you? Yeah, okay. Here's what I would like to work through um, in terms of our uh, conversation today. Um, what do avalanches have to do with Jackson? We've already touched on this a little bit, but um, we'll, we'll dig a little deeper into that really soon. Um, I've had this question already several times today and last night. How successful are we at predicting avalanches? Um, it would seem that if we could predict them, um, that would assist a great deal with keeping us out of dangerous locations. Um, how successful are we at detecting avalanches? Now, you might guffaw at that and say, you know, it's pretty obvious, isn't it? But there's actually a lot of subtle questioning that goes on in this. Um, have you heard of infrasound before? So we'll learn a little bit about it. This was new to me as well, um, just a little over a decade ago. We'll talk somewhat scientifically about the science of infrasound and how we might use it in the avalanche problem. And again, I will have to ensure that we give credit where credit is due. And although that's the last topic, I'm gonna repeat it a few times. Huge footnote that it's gonna be difficult for anyone else in the audience to read, but I do need to say that um, we didn't discover this thing called infrasound. Um, in fact, there's a wonderful human story behind how he became connected to it. Um, and also, I'm one of only about 20 people involved in the project that I'm gonna describe. Um, there are many other players in this game, several of them who are residents here in Jackson Hole, who are far more important and influential in making this project get through to where it came than I was. So I'm just here to um, provide a little bit of education and inspire some motivation for learning more as well. Okay, that's where we're headed. So you've seen an avalanche before, you've heard avalanches occur, um, all of those frightful experiences, I think, right, right in your face. Um, this is a dangerous possibility, isn't it? Um, well, who's been impacted by avalanches in Jackson Hole? Can you relate to this photo on the upper left-hand side? Did you know that we're actually at the centennial? Um, we're at the 100-year time zone from the first recorded avalanche death in Wyoming, and that was on the Teton Pass mail carrier route. Um, it actually occurred on the other side, the Idaho side of the pass, but a mail carrier died due to an avalanche 100 years ago. Um, who's affected? Well, transportation for sure. Um, one of our principal partners in the work that we'll discuss was the Wyoming Department of Transportation. Um, who's affected here in any way if Highway 22 is shut down in the winter? Does it affect you? Yeah, in big ways. Recreationists, um, that's supposed to be a slight guffaw between the, uh, the generations of snow machine, but um, tell me something about the, the one that's leaping off of the snow over there. Why, why might um, that one be more affected by avalanche than the one above? They can travel into the terrain where it's more likely to be in the midst of an avalanche, right? Um, backcountry skiers, backcountry snowshoers and so forth, a lot of us can be affected by avalanche. Um, there seems to be a theme of talking about death here. I had to do this, it add, added the slide. Um, if, if we look at avalanche concern from the standpoint of um, fatalities, here's what the record shows from the Colorado Avalanche Information Center. They do a very, very good job of um, recording the statistics and providing us with overviews of, in this case, fatalities in the United States from 1950 through the 2011-2012 um, time frame. Tell me what's happening. What's the general trend here? Yeah, things are headed up. Why? Give me some reasons for why. Is the snow just becoming that much more dangerous? More people going into the backcountry. I think absolutely. Um, any other possibilities here? What was that lull out here in, you know, near 1998 and so forth? What was happening then? Yeah, probably lack of snow at that particular time. Um, so, we need snow for avalanches. Um, maybe we should just avoid snow, right? And we'll never have a problem with avalanches. How's that go over in Jackson? Should we, you know, 
Yeah, not really well, right? Okay, good, good. So you're, you're with me on this. Um, if we look across the states, the United States, and that accumulation of where the action is, um, Wyoming, lowest population of the states and so on, we're out here in the, we're fairly busy in terms of avalanche. Um, again, that rings true with regard to how we recreate, where we travel, and so forth. Um, now, I do live in the southeast corner of Wyoming, and I am a ski patroller and involved in search and rescue. Um, so I have neighbors close by, and in fact, um, some zones very close by that have contributed to this very large number um, in the Colorado area. Tell me why um, some other places that are classically snowy, and we might think about recreating, don't seem to have an avalanche problem. If we describe problem in terms of death, what's going on here? So if we look out into New Hampshire, New York, and so forth, lots of snow? Lots of snow, but I don't think they have to ski mountainous. Okay. Has anyone mountaineered or skied in those areas? Can you talk about the kind of terrain that's there? Or how about, should I say, the quality of the snow? How do we refer to that? So give me a description for New York snow. Yeah, somewhere between slush and ice. It does one of those two things, right? Okay, so in many ways we have a strong structure to the snow there, and it's not as likely to slide on us. Um, what do we advertise out here in Colorado and Utah and Montana and Wyoming? That champagne powder, right? Um, a little too much champagne might be a whole lot too much in terms of preservation of our life and so forth. So I think we can agree that um, avalanches can be a problem. Here's some action from immediately around this area. Um, can you recognize the area in the upper right hand display up there? There's an avalanche. Is that any consequence whatsoever that that avalanche occurred? What's, what's the result of that avalanche? Wander over here toward the left hand side and look at this uh, pile of snow in the middle of the road. Um, that would be a horrible thing if it happened when you were on that road at the same time, right? That would be a bad deal. Um, and it takes a long time, and it's dangerous to clean that up. Um, the picture in the bottom left-hand corner is up the Hoback Canyon. Um, and here's some of the technology that we still employ in order to do what? Why do, why do we have that howitzer in the middle of the road? What's happening there? So we're trying to reduce the risk of avalanche by cordoning off, stopping travel in the area, and knowing that the snow is going to slide, we're going to incite the riot when we can make it as safe as possible. A reasonable thing for us to attempt to do. Now, I, I love these photos because they are the antithesis of what usually happens for the Y dot transportation management and safety people. Rarely is it a blue sky day when they are setting up for the pictures, of course, you know, and uh, making sure everything happens appropriately with exciting the snow. No, it's more like two or three in the morning. It's a horrible storm. They can't see what's going on. They lock the howitzer into a location that has been promising before. They shoot into the dark. If snow moved, how are they ever going to know? Yeah, that's where this technology comes into play. So that's where we're headed. Now to get there is a little bit of a long path, and you're going to have to bear with me in terms of, um, kind of the science that has to happen associated with this thing. Um, how familiar? Who plays music? Who, who's uh, either a musician, a vocalist, anything like that? Anyone? So can you tell me you know, anything about the music and the content of it? Um, why do we separate um, our crowd and the choir benches into different sections and so forth? Um, would you have me singing particular parts of arias and so forth? Uh, are you familiar with the frequency content, with the ability to separate information, if you will, associated with the highs and the lows, the trebles and the bases and so forth, that kind of stuff. Um, where we're headed to is the ability to think and listen with our ears to look at events 
and not just in locations such as Glory Bowl, but do you recognize these two locations around Jackson? Um, the one on the right-hand side is creatively described as the Taco Bell slide. <laughs> so we, we lose imagination occasionally. Um, how about this one on the left-hand side? Do you recognize that? It's one of the most concerning, I think, for me and for many of the YDOT folks in terms of the potential for very, very disastrous outcome. Um, it, you could almost take that photo from Jackson High School if you had a zoom lens. That is immediately south of Jackson, and that run has been known to not only cover the road, but also move cars off of the road and across the fence and into the pasture. Um, knowing that that has happened, that a slide has occurred, would be one thing that we could be listening for and then alarming so that we could stop travel, for example. Um, and what we're going to need to learn how to do is how do we separate the things we hear from the rest of the noise, if you will, that's out there. How can I listen for avalanches and do that in an effective way? Now, this standard question um, is one that we have to face immediately, because I'm not talking about technology that is immediately predictive of avalanches occurring. That's not the path that we're most immediately contacting. We are attempting to say an avalanche just occurred. And not only that, it occurred right here, and here's how far the snow moved. That's what we're trying to describe. Now, that data does factor into this question that's being asked inappropriately. Um, forecasting of avalanches um, is quite scientific, and it involves a large number of variables. Um, what's the strength of the existing snowpack? If I have a history recently of occurrence of avalanche, where it's at and how much the snow has moved, that actually gives me a somewhat indirect but an appropriate set of data to describe snowpack strength. Um, the rate of deposition of new snow is absolutely a big factor in the prediction and, in this case, forecasting problem. So a lot of meteorological elements come into play. Um, that was not me at the keyboard just hitting win, 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 win. It's that important deposition and movement of snow. Um, we heard about taxidermy. This is taxa snow. We're moving snow all over the place. Um, and what's happening again across the local terrain is something that we can be observing by eye, by ear, but in order to cover the terrain very, very appropriately, it would take a large number of eyes and ears. What we attempt to do with the technology we'll talk about is to automate that process and cover a very broad area, actually. Um, who's familiar with the uh, avalanche forecasts coming out of the Bridger Teton National Forest site? Um, they're definitely big players. In fact, um, we owe them a lot for allowing us to come into their laboratory. Um, they provide a everyday morning description of the various zones of common travel around the Jackson Hole area and provide advisories in this colored way of What's the potential um, danger of moving into um, one of those areas associated with avalanche threat? Um, the rose that's described on the bottom right-hand side um, is something that's used by the Colorado Avalanche Information Center to try to put all of these words and numbers into one picture to interpret the same. The idea with the rose is that the outer ring is the lower elevations. The more middle ring, kind of mid elevations, and the center one are the high elevations above tree line and so forth. The colors describe the potential for avalanche release, and moving around the rose is the slope aspect. Now, the rose that's up here is quite common of northern Colorado in that the majority of our snow carrying winds are coming out of the southwest. They deposit snows on the northeast slopes. Those become very, very dangerous slopes to be traveling on or underneath. So this is actually a quite typical rose. Um, if things are moving into the red and then the black coloring up there, those are stay at home in the hot tub days. Those are don't even venture close kind of days. Again, the technology I'll talk about is an attempt to provide 
these folks who are trying to predict avalanche with some more data that goes into the strength of snowpack and what's happening in local terrain. What's the ability to know that kind of content? Um, anyone recognize these places? This look familiar at all? So there's the tramway top, the old tramway top, I should say, um, a meteorological station on the mountain resort, um, several locations at which people are trying to gather this data. So we've got meteorological data. Any idea of how many stations out there are gathering wind, temperature, amount of snowpack, just around the Jackson Hole area? Any ideas? Yeah, we could talk to Bob Comey, who has to travel around and maintain all of those all season long, and as he would say, it's a full-time job to keep up with them. They're gathering a lot of data, a lot of information. Um, what are they looking at over there on the far right-hand upper and mid portion? What are they looking at? I see a hand holding up some snow. Isn't that beautiful stuff? Anyone know? Yeah, surface hoar in this case. Those frond-like crystals that grow on the top of snow, it's beautiful stuff, absolutely beautiful. But we also know that depositing snow on top of that then and layering it on top is like um, putting a very large <laughs> mobile object on top of champagne glasses. As soon as you break through the champagne glasses, that mobile object is going to take off. You're going to move snow on top of people. Um, sun glare on the snow, ice on top of the snow over there. There's a lot of gathering of information in this process of trying to predict, is this slope likely to avalanche? Um, and no absolute guarantees of being able to say, I've gathered all my scientific data and it will absolutely avalanche today. Can't get to that point. We can gather a lot of um, it just doesn't feel right, and there are enough factors added together here that I shouldn't travel, but that other connotation of we're getting a lot of good snow, that's when I want to travel, often lures us in. I told you this was going to be a tough one. Can we detect avalanches? And you say, sure, just look out there. You saw one. But if we really want to know more about the terrain overall, we want to be able to detect avalanches in the sense of um, as much terrain as possible to see where it has occurred. And not just that there was an avalanche here, it would help us a great deal in knowing the overall extent of how much snow moved and so forth. Um, we do get a lot of reports. Bob collects a huge amount of data from people bringing in information for saying, hey, we observed avalanches in the following two places. Um, Brett Riotto, anyone recognize that name? He graduated um, this spring as a computer science bachelor of science at the University of Wyoming. He's a Jackson Hole kid. His senior design project was a handheld application so that these snow reports could be turned in by cell phone as rapidly as possible. A really neat application. What we're looking at is can we help again with speeding up the process? Can we help in sounding the alarm um, and in providing enough information for people to make intelligent decisions about travel? Okay, we're off on a tangent here. Um, we tried to set the stage for we're in Jackson where we understand quite a bit about snow and we know the avalanche is a problem. Well, what is this stuff called infrasound? Um, this is Jerry's five minute physics lecture. Are you ready? Strap yourself into your physics seat. Here we go. Have you heard the statement about human hearing? Um, we can hear across the so-called bandwidth of about 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. Have you heard that statement before? Okay. Can you, can you relate then to this idea of, say, the keyboard of a piano? Can, can you hear the left-hand side keys as they ring? The frequency on this far side that low A, B, and so forth. That's in the territory of 40 to 45 hertz. Um, the far end on the 88 key keyboard way the heck out at that side, anyone got a rough idea on frequency for that? You know, if I could do it, but my voice is inappropriate, going ding, ding, ding. Any idea what that frequency is way, way out there? You would think like that's almost at the upper end of things. That's only about four kilohertz. So, Humans, as it's stated, can hear or sense from about 20 to 20 kilohertz. Um, 
Infrasound is below this range, below that rumble that we get on the very left-hand side of the keys. Um, in fact, humans can't hear it. Sometimes we can feel it. And in fact, um, along with Area 57 and other descriptions like that, there's a lot of uh, mockery out there about defensive weapons or offensive weapons that produce low frequency sound and give people headaches, et cetera, and so on. Um, there's also some good physiological basis for that, but I don't know anything more about it than that. Um, as we'll discover, avalanches produce actually sound across a very broad spectrum out into the audible portion that we can hear from the keyboard. But what's very interesting is that they do produce sound over here on this far, far left-hand side. And that's advantageous to us in a couple of ways. Um, there are many sources of infrasound. And again, think of this from the standpoint of, can you imagine hearing a rocket launch? Can you imagine yourself hearing that? Absolutely, right? It, many of us grew up with sitting in the classroom and watching the NASA launches and so on, all the rumbling audio that came across the television. But they also produce infrasound, something which is below that level of our hearing and is quite characteristic of a rocket launch. Um, some surprising things, maybe. Over there on the severe storms, um, the aurora can produce infrasound. Um, any other intriguing ones around here that people might be interested in listening for? Um, earthquakes sound like a reasonable thing to listen for. Um, avalanches down here on the bottom, so that's thumbs up. Um, nuclear and chemical explosives? That has a strong connection to how we got into this game, actually. So there are a large number of potential producers of this sound phenomenon. Um, and a few that are uh, actually quite interesting. Now, there's a lot of synergy in the way in which things occur um, in everyone's life. Um, this one is related to another Wyoming kid. He grew up in Lander. He loves to ski. Um, he studied with us as an undergraduate in electrical engineering and as a graduate student. And one of his strongest desires was to stay in the Rocky Mountains, to be an engineer in the Rocky Mountains. Um, he found gainful employment in Sheridan, Wyoming, and he was very successful. He could have let, just rested back and been perfectly happy in his job, but it was in a chair in an office. And one of the things that he wanted to do was move his office outside a little more frequently. Um, some folks, the Department of Commerce, um, reported something in a very obscure location. Um, this young man happened to be looking through the Federal Register online one day and saw a call for technology transfer that said, um, array processing for detection of snow avalanches. Um, that's almost obscure in the form of some of the other titles that Paul gave you earlier. But that's exactly the area that he was working in. He was an array processor. And Snow, an avalanche, caught his attention and said, hey, this is something that I could deal with. Now, why would Department of Commerce be even thinking about this? Why, what's their impact with avalanches? Sure, interstate traffic and travel, um, railroads, highways, and so forth. Um, would it be any stretch whatsoever that some of these folks were also, as scientists, connected, believe it or not, with the Department of Commerce, listening for atomic blasts? Yeah. Um, in fact, we have fairly large listening arrays all over the United States looking for these things. What they discovered was there was noise coming into the things that they were hearing. They discovered that while they were listening for that next blast in North Korea, infrasound happens to have the advantage of traveling over extremely large distances. So maybe it's good that we can't hear infrasound ourselves. If we could, we would be hearing events around the world. From a sensing standpoint, that's advantageous of from Pinedale, Wyoming, we can listen for atomic blasts in the Asian Peninsula. Well, but then there's this noise that shows up in the winter. 
and our job is to listen for atomic blasts, what, why is this no, noise showing up? Someone connected it and correlated it with snow avalanches in the Rockies. Um, the Department of Commerce said, okay, we're no longer gonna hide the fact that we're listening. Um, here's what we've heard. Can anyone extrapolate this into something that will assist us and also maybe even make it a commercial product? So that's where this young man picked up. One of the first places we had to begin working and looking at this was the ability to sense it. Um, it's actually a craft, maybe a magic or a science, to build sensors capable of listening for infrasound. Um, one way of describing this is that a human can't hear it, but if you're a whale, you can probably hear it very, very well, because they have large structures for hearing that kind of thing. Um, and the processing that we're going to do to take all the pretty words off of it is nothing really fancier than looking at the idea of listening with at least two ears, and the time of receipt of the signal tells you the direction from which the sound is coming. So if they were to turn off the speakers on that side, you would have speech coming from you from only one speaker set up here. It would be quite directional to you. That's the game that we're playing with infrasound. Now, if two ears are good, then three or four ears might be even better, right? Don't imagine this on a person, though. No, don't go that far. Um, that's the game that we began playing, building the sensors and beginning to, if you will, listen for this stuff. Now, this is an array um, that's been in place for a very long time in Greenland, just to give you an idea of the scale or the size of these things. Um, they're going well beyond the idea of just a couple of ears is good here, right? Um, a huge number of ears for listening. And this array in the sense of um, the orientation of it and so forth is an attempt to say, I want to be able to very, very accurately identify where the sound is coming from. Um, but you can get a sense maybe for the scale of the problem here. In order to do this, we're talking about some fairly large pieces of real estate to set up this kind of an array. That could be a problem. Um, here's another example from the United States. And this is an array. You can get an idea of scale in that upper right-hand corner is a chain link fence corner. Um, that's gravel piled over the end of these array things. Um, that is an engineer's approach to, we're hearing too much noise and we want to get rid of that noise. So we'll pile some gravel over the top of these ears. Yeah, I did. I, I'm an engineer, I apologize. We do strange things occasionally, but they often work. Um, some of the early attempts we had at building sensors for these things were, were I think, absolutely uh, ridiculous looking, but you can get the scale for the things that we were having to work with. We, we needed to work with the size problem. Um, there is a company, Chaparral Physics, from Alaska, which again has um, interest in listening to a lot of things around the world, building these large sensors. And yes, that is um, the equipment and plumbing that you would use on your very own um, lawn irrigation system. We attach soaker hoses to those and use those as the ears for listening. Um, we've worked in many ways to scale that down to something that can survive and not take up too much real estate in the locations where we want to be hearing, where we want to be listening to this stuff. So several generations, in fact, of scaling that down to something that will fit and work and actually survive a season in the snowpack. Um, here's what it ends up looking like. Here's the kind of thing that we can get. If you'll let me turn the sound into a signal, um, and here again comes the connection almost directly with Jackson. So we're looking in time, units of seconds up there, of just some, a little bit of wind waving along and so on uh, until an explosion occurs. Why an explosion? Are we listening for nuclear events here from Jackson? No, we're in a laboratory and we need an avalanche right now. So what better place to go than the Jackson Hole Mountain Resort when they're doing control? We can point our array in the right direction. We can identify an explosion occurring. And then, although it's hard for our eyes to see the upper display of what's going on, that is movement of snow. In the colored display down here, right at 60, where the explosion occurs, that is a huge amount of sound coming into the ears. If you will, you would jerk back. You would say, that's really loud. Now that redistribution of 
what we call frequency content, where the avalanche occurs, is the characteristic we're trying to pluck out of the sound in order to say, that's avalanche, and with multiple ears, I can tell you where it's going on, where it started. Um, now, we can, we're confronted with a lot of problems. Um, no avalanche is going on here at the moment, but just traveling in time through a beautiful morning, afternoon, and the nighttime winds picked up. So we've got to turn our ears off to a lot of things. Um, being close to highway corridors, we have to turn off our ears to things like large trucks, etc. cetera. Um, here was our laboratory, and again, um, we owe a lot to the Jackson Hole Mountain Resort, Bob Comey, all the colleagues and the ski patrol and so forth, with pri providing us an opportunity to get into locations where they do regular assessment of the snow, regular bombing to get snow moving, and then we can make attempts at mapping that stuff out. I'm going to try to play a game with technology here and give you a view of how that plays out for us. Um, here's what we're able to do at this time frame. Um, this was about 2004, I believe, with putting some eyes and ears to what's going on here. There are multiple ears in that upper right-hand corner of trying to sense and see what's going on, to see what's happening. Um, a blast was set off and a little bit of ski cutting before that, and we see a huge amount of energy intensity of infrasonics right on the spot where that snow began to move. And this is in our early stage of understanding how to detect and identify um, where snow is at and what it's up to. But again, in the case of looking into the dark, here's a way of putting some ears out there that are eyes in the dark to tell us we did get snow to move. So an early generation of the things that we were able to build and get to work. Um, the mountain resort was able to use that successfully again when they needed to know a couple of things. Is snow actually moving? Um, and as we got better at this, how far did it go? Where did it actually move to? Um, after a few generations, we were able to produce a very tight sensor box and in fact quite small overall. Um, one of our biggest environmental problems was um, snow moves actually a lot, even right down on the ground. These things got drug all over the place in one season. You cannot believe how much snow moves actually right at the surface of the ground. It's amazing. So we had to get very, very rugged. Um, we moved on to another um, prime spot, and you're familiar with it, the Glory Bowl, so that we could listen and watch for snow movement there. Um, a couple of different sensor sites were attempted so we could see both the Twin Slides area as well as the Glory Bowl itself. And on that side, you can see now the ideas of listening progress to the point of the blue is the early movement of snow, green, yellow, and red, the transition of snow movement through. And our final product is able to actually produce that in real time. So they can set up their excitement off of the GasX systems and watch snow move as it's actually moving. And they can do that in the dark. Is that a good thing to have? That's where we ended up. Now, um, I'm sure that several of you are uh, familiar with um, avalanche difficulties, if you will, in the area, and you know, bad things that have happened, death, injury, and so forth. Um, that particular array, all the way over midway in the middle of Mount Glory, actually was able to see or hear an avalanche on the back here on Taylor Mountain. That did result in one death, but wrapped all the way around the mountain, if you will, not line of sight in any way, shape, or form, in real time told DOT that there was an avalanche back there. Um, so it can hear through a lot of different locations. Okay, people people involved in this. We're currently also running the system at the Big Cottonwood Canyon, or excuse me, the Little Cottonwood Canyon in Utah, um, several slide paths, and here's the real-time display that the UDOT folks have available to them, so they can do the same thing with looking at avalanche occurrence, another very important transportation corridor. Um, people, the humans involved, um, just to give you some brief of these folks. 
Ernie Scott was the young gentleman working at Intermountain Labs. He does love to ski, and oh, by the way, fishes a lot too. Um, he's the poster child for how to spend your free time at work because he's always looking at things. That's how he discovered this idea from the Department of Commerce. Um, Jackson Hole was very, very good to Ernie by providing a laboratory and hosting him actually for several years. Um, and his professors are rightly proud of him. He's done a great job. So he told me I had to show those. That's him enjoying the snow. Um, Bob Comey has been an, an immense resource to us. Um, you may hear him on the radio. You probably see the results of the things that he does in terms of avalanche forecasting in this area. He provided us with the laboratory and all the connections we needed in order to bring our experiments here and then finally put it into full production and work. Um, and that's Bob out at one of those oodles of stations getting them back up and alive and getting the climatological data coming through. Who knows Jamie? Anyone know Jamie out? He's uh, one of the gunner guys, right? Um, and involved in Teton County search and rescue as well as keeping your road corridors safe and alive and working. Um, maintains and uses the technology. And uh, I had to put this one up here for him. There's training for the upcoming snow season. Um, blasting away and learning how to, uh, or I guess, Got a sight in your gun, right? Jamie has a great job. I'm envious all the time of what goes on. Um, and finally, some of my other cohort in crime, um, Bob Kubitschek and John Pierre. Um, a lot of things have gone on in order to bring these things together, to bring this technology together, to make it work. Um, and yes, I am a ski patroller. Um, there are a lot of connections behind all of this that I couldn't have predicted. I had no idea that this stuff would go on. Um, Al Bedard is, we've called him semi-retired for an extremely large number of years. He's the technologist from NOAA and Department of Commerce who brought this forward. And Chris Hayward from Southern Methodist University. Um, if you want to talk about a nerd knowing how to listen, that's uh, Chris. He knows how to listen for infrasound. Um, in the end, we have systems that are working here right now, used on the DOT Highway 22 Pass. Um, they're working in Little Cottonwood Canyon, and several other places are evaluating and using sensors. This bottom one, there are a lot of sensors in use for applications they won't tell us about. So what was built is being used in many, many locations. Um, several people responsible for making this work. It, it wasn't cheap, it wasn't free, um, nationally as well as a couple of states involved, and we appreciate their contributions. Uh, summary statement is that Here's our group, actually, and our families involved in some of the early field work to describe this project. Um, I, I thank Jackson Hole in so many different ways for having the snow, having the terrain, but having the people who work so wonderfully with us to do this task. Um, bring people together and you can do some amazing things. So thank you, Jackson Hole. Do we have time for questions? The, the only latency is the time of sound travel through the air. So you're talking a, a very, very fast transfer in terms of we could provide a system that could flash lights and drop a gate before the snow reached the end. Yeah. Tip typically, no. The, the release happens, and the infrasound is associated not so much with the release, but the pushing of the air in front. Another place that um, we absolutely observe infrasound is in front of blunt trains and semi-tractor trucks and so forth. It's that movement against the air. That's what's causing it. So we're not directly predicting an avalanche at all. We're just trying to fire the really obvious gun that says avalanche right there. From, from actually the, the snow pushing against the air. So yeah, who's traveled in the backcountry in any way, shape, or form and felt the snow settle underneath them, you hear that oomph. Yeah, there may be a pulse of infrasound associated with that, but not a sustained movement with it. Yep. Other questions? You know, I sometimes wonder in, when they set off the explosives, particularly at the skier, uh -huh. as if they're weakening the snowpack, 
a couple of years ago, we had a, a, a ski patrolman throw a bomb and nothing slid, and then he skied below it. And it was out yeah. Of yeah. Then, you know, the, the whole objective of the abatement process is to make the snow move, to put enough force into the snowpack so that if it's going to break, it will occur with that explosion. And there's no 100% science in that to say, I know I've put enough force into it that there's no way that it can move. And you know, I have a huge amount of appreciation for the snow professionals who are putting their life on the line for us every single day by making their human evaluation of, yes, we've done our best job to make the snow move. And you know, their dedication to their task is exactly what happened, that Wally understood that, well, I think I've done the best I can, I can ski that, and it wasn't true. Yeah? Can you sense it from above, from a tower or a satellite, or is it air to poor a conductor? Yeah, in fact, it, it's better to be on the ground to do this. So a surprise to me is that we put the installations in, in the fall, they're down on the ground surface, and snow over the top of them does not cut the infrasound received by the systems. It travels actually very, very well at the ground interface. Um, pulling them up high, um, we have not had great success with it, and in fact, um, there are many reasons to believe that we would only be gathering additional things like wind noise and so forth. So getting it under the snowpack absolutely cuts down on wind noise. So we love it when it snows on top of the sensors. We just hate it in the springtime. We have to go collect them and they move 20 feet that way. Yeah. Are you using them for the earthquakes also? So they are used around the world for earthquake sensing, for volcanic activity, um, movement of magma, produces infrasound that is traveling through crustal areas in the Earth itself. So they're used as a general sensor for a large number of events that people are interested in listening for. Yeah? You know, it seems like the European countries are in some ways ahead of us. For example, Switzerland mm -hmm. seems to obviously stop the yeah, it's been interesting to watch. I know um, Bob Comey is not in the valley this week because he's actually in France at the International Snow Science Workshop. And um, the folks at Davos, Switzerland, have been really, in many ways, the premier center for avalanche research. And it's, you know, it's quite obvious. If you look at many of their communities, they are on the mountainside or at the mountain bottom. And there are historical records of entire communities being wiped out by avalanche. Um, they deal with it every day of the winter season. It is interesting to see at ISSW this year, both um, the Swiss researchers at Davos and Italian researchers, and now the French, are beginning to use infrasound. So this is one place where we actually may have been ahead of them. But in, I, I agree, they, they have dealt with it for a long, long time and um, in many ways were in front of us. Although, Rod Newcomb really knew what to do in terms of taking care of a mountain resort. So Jackson Hole stands out as kind of a gold standard in that policy and abatement. Yeah? What are we seeing toward the prediction of avalanches? And I say that because I don't see what the worth is of knowing where one went except to go dig up people. Yeah. So I've been on the receiving end of having to do the rescue or the recovery all, all too often. It's, it's not a neat thing. So it would be great to be able to say, I, I wish that we could just say, no, don't go. It's going to happen. Um, who's been in graduate school? Who's been a, what we would call a paid slave in some way or another? Um, Montana State University has a wonderful group of avalanche researchers. And they said, we're going to hit this in a really, really hard way by paying some graduate students to go out and do in the snow studies for an entire season to better understand the best of science right now to say across one slope can we predict avalanche behavior and character. Um, the students did everything faithfully every single day. What they discovered was 50 feet in that direction from the science that I just did today is entirely different. So even across one slope, the science was 
I don't want to say inconsistent, but incredibly variable. So that's one, been one of the largest roadblocks to our attempts to, if you will, be predictive about this. It's um, a difficult problem, a very difficult problem. We may see changes in it, I hope we do, but we've thrown radar at it, we've thrown a lot of tools at it, and they have not been strong and predictive for it. Any other questions? Yeah? Are, uh, are these similar to seismic sensors? In fact, they, they've taken over some of the roles that seismic sensors had. Um, and anyone here uh, gone out and pounded geophones into the surface in order to listen for things and so on? Yeah. Um, these sensors have been used to replace some of the functionality that geophones had. In fact, they're richer in the sense of the breadth or bandwidth of frequency that can be represented. One difficulty is you would have to bury them in order to restrict the amount of atmospheric information that comes to them. And as we saw, even burying these things under snow, atmospheric effects do get into them still. So that's one of their problems. They're not true, extremely directional. A lot of signal processing goes into finding direction from them. Yeah. What about the density of the snowpack? Can you use ultrasound? Um, you can use ultrasound. Um, there's a wonderful instrument developed um, University of Alberta called a snow penetrometer. And if you see a snow ski patroller carrying one of these around, you think that you should duck behind a tree because it looks like a large machine gun. Um, they approach the snow and use a ram to move through the snowpack in order to detect at very high precision changes in density of the snow because we do have some sense that it's those rapid changes in density that tell us where snow will move overall. Um, they've used it across many slopes. The students from Montana State did it on their slopes. Huge variability across a single slope. Yeah? So how do they determine where to shoot the cannon and do all those things? Um, they are experts at their task and at their job. They have a long-standing history of snowpack, the conditions of when has it avalanched before and so forth, they are users and appliers of their knowledge because it's their life to begin with that depends upon the correct abatement. Yeah. Were there, the Montana State study that you were just talking about, were there any take home lessons about how useful digging snow pits are? So the very sad take home message was one of if you dig the snow pit, which we should all do in the backcountry as we're traveling in order to get some idea of how stable the snowpack is. If you get a pit that appears to be just entirely safe, I mean, no problem whatsoever, dig another pit over there just to see if it changes a little bit. And a little bit might be all you need. So yeah, it ended up turning off some of our ideas of this doesn't take too much to assess the snow as just a traveler through the snow path. You know, dig one pit and you'll be good. No. Continue to assess. Um, and it did lead to some ideas of how to assess just with a ski pole very regularly as you're traveling through the snowpack. Yep. Yes? I think you wanted to mention that New York Times article. Yeah. State avalanche. My, my, my real summary statement is one of what we call the human factors uh, associated with avalanche and avalanche travel, train travel, etc. Um, if you didn't see it, the New York Times produced a, a wonderful multimedia uh, study of a horrible avalanche accident that happened at Stevens Pass. Um, it involved a large number of people who should have known better and not traveled into the region that they went into. Um, these are people who were familiar with the area through long-standing decades of history with it. They traveled into the area when they should have known better because it would be prone to avalanche. Um, the outcome was um, death of several individuals and um, all agreed, those who survived, that all the appropriate red flags were in place, but there was so much gung-ho forward attitude of this and the group was so large that they just went anyway. Um, and the message I think that's coming through a lot of avalanche awareness coursework and so forth now is allow everyone to have a vote to say no in terms of travel and allow that vote, in fact, enable that vote in a very strong way to come forward. If anyone feels it's hinky, they should say so and the group should respect that. But 
catch it. Um, Google New York Times Stevens Pass and um, spend an hour and a half or two hours and it, it's a very revealing <coughs> article. Yeah. Are the European countries using the same technology? Like I said, the, just this year in ISSW, um, there are papers from Switzerland, Italy, and France beginning to use infrasound. So I think we, we had a really strong impact. Ernie had a, an extremely strong impact. He went out and beat the drum very, very heavily, beginning, in fact, when ISSW appeared here at the Mountain Resort in the early 2000s. He first brought that up and published it. Yep. Yes? Are you using this to create maps? Uh, history of slide activity. Absolutely. Um, that can be published. What, what areas? Are yeah. Slide from both for frequency and size. Absolutely. Uh, anyone know the McAllister name? Um, anyone know Chris McAllister by any chance? He is uh, an exceptionally talented GIS scientist. Um, he and Bob have mapped the mountain resort with their zones, frequency of occurrence, and can tie it to weather-related events and so forth. Um, they used some of our data in order to enhance their mapping and so forth. They've proceeded and done the very same thing with the Teton Pass area. So yeah, the ability to say, we know the extent of where avalanche has occurred before, and we can put that down in a very precise mapping level has been a great advance, I think, for a lot of folks. Just to say that, yeah, avalanches have occurred here under these conditions before. Yeah. Um, you'd have to talk with Bob in terms of availability of them. He's in control. Yeah. I realize that I am the last thing between you and lunch, and I appreciate again your hosting of us here in Jackson. Um, we would all love to come back again. Hint, hint, nod, nod, wink, wink. Anyway, thank you. <laughs>